Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for Sour Grabs, kind of, we'll call it. We have no Alex Pulowski tonight. Feels very, very weird. I am not used to him having the nerve to take days off, but I thought if Alex wasn't going to be here, who could I get that's almost in the polar opposite direction? You can't replace an Alex Pulowski. You cannot replace the Lewis Black of our channel, but we can go in the other direction. We can have someone who has the same amount of energy as Alex, but more of a sweet sheet disposition than a sour graps one. I've got the wonderful Kimmy Sokol from Pop Break with us. Kimmy, how are you? I am great. I'm so excited to be here. This is like my Fightful debut. I've never been on Fightful, but oh I know, but it was like my 2024 goal that I was going to get on Fightful somehow, some way, and we made it happen by the end of March. Did make it happen. I figured we would have been complaining about ROH H champions never being around on this channel before we got you to... <laughs> The sour grap side of things. But guys, please support Kimmy. Um, go follow her on Twitter if you can. Um, support Pop Break as well. They do some really good work. I got to meet Kimmy. I think World's End was the, the first time I got to kind of meet you. I think. Yeah. Like you came like kind of late. And I was like, is that Kate? I don't want to be wrong. So <laughs> Typical. Typical. And me. Sorry. We were, my, oh, just we were at the my scrum. Treasure. We were at and the then scrum I was together. Like, huh. There the amount go. of times I have been in the same room as people and not known and just felt terrible about that because I think they think I'm ignoring them, but I'm just watching wrestling and like, so whatever, uh, is too many, too many. But guys, get in your super chats, get in your humper chats. Uh, please leave a thumbs up on this video. It helps people find us in the algorithms. And I know we give you this whole laundry list of things to do at the beginning of the show here, but we will remind you to subscribe to Fightful select.com we're gonna have Corey brennan on here to tell you about his fightful select scoop skis with a little bit more context shortly but you heard about the carmelo call-up expectations that'll be shortly after wrestlemania uh some scoops that got confirmed tonight natalia accepting lola vice's challenge uh dijack ratio and sean spears to open the show was on the fightful select scoops as well and some other news including the motor city machine guns wrapping up the killer kelly clarification news say that 10 times fast and also i don't know if everybody knows this but you get uh interview notes and uh the interviews first on fightful select as well so a great tom lawler interview that was up uh the chat is asking for what the puns are Luis has suggested boat puns so uh let's welcome kimmy in the weirdest way possible that we always do on the show we have a pun for the night it's a wrestling pun plus something else Natalia called herself the boat, the best of all time, right? So let's do some boat puns. I think we've done them before, but Alex is on vacation, so it doesn't count. This is like a, a lights out match of post shows. <laughs> so please, let's do some boat puns. But we've got some chats to start us off. Lupungi Vice, who has my favorite, favorite, favorite handle of all time, uh, saying, I'm here for Kate's entertainment and her hair looks ravishing today. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Continual hair compliments in super chat form just make my day because then i get to go back to sean and tell him how much money my hair makes and just be like you can't you can't win against this all right you're not going to win against this head of lettuce but cam watson also saying greetings sgs it's my birthday today can i request festivity to perform birthday death day by death clock yes you can tiffany stratton will emerge at the end of the night in an impression to sing that to you have a great night. Well, happy birthday, Cam. Thank you so much for the early support. But we are going to get in to the show. But before we do that, Kimmy, let's give you a second to introduce yourself. Um, tell us what you're doing at Pop Break. Tell us what you've got WrestleMania week coming up. What don't I have WrestleMania week should be Tell me about it, girl. another question. <laughs> but yeah, hi, I'm Kimmy. I write for the Pop Break. I'm the senior editor of the wrestling section over there. Basically, Bill, who's the editor, he's a big wrestling fan like me. And he's been wanting to do more wrestling stuff. And then he met me two years ago. And I'm like, let's do some things with this. And it's been an amazing ride with that. The other cool thing about what I do is I work the convention scene. And yes, I work with all your favorite superstars, guys. There's a lot of pros and a hell of a lot of cons with that job. But uh, wrestling cons. Get it? Uh, uh, cons. I got you. <laughs> See, look, I, I did a joke. Does that count? Like, you know, I tried oh, there you really go. hard. But 
Next week is WrestleCon. It's the biggest convention of the year. Every single wrestler you could think of will be there from former WWE superstars to AEW to CMLL to Joshi indie stars. Literally everything and anything will be there. So if you're looking for something to do in Philly, you should head over to WrestleCon. Go to WrestleCon.com and all your ticket information will be there. There's also a cheat sheet up with literally like every single talent that's going to be there that gets updated every single day because we're still announcing talent and it's next Thursday or well next friday but next thursday we start with the super show and yeah so if you're in the philadelphia area go check out russellcon and go to russellcon.com find out all your information there that's what's up i will be there sean rossap will be there we are going to have a great time uh i did not think about what happened in baltimore with the boat puns so if you don't feel comfortable sending in a boat pun because of real world sad stuff uh feel free to send in an alternate pun category. We'll do like single alone abandonment puns because I have Kimmy here, but let, we'll just like guilt trip Alex. We'll make him feel bad for for leaving us, taking an entire time off. But JW Pringle, my adopted brother, saying, Kill Kate, vacationing Alex, new lady, <laughs> Alex, Kimmy, sisters, Luis, and all of the SGS. What can I say? NXT was very NXT. NXT was odd in that I felt like there were a lot more promos and stuff tonight and things in the vignettes. It, it almost felt like tonight was the, the real go home more than next week. Um, so it, it, it felt a little different. I loved the prime target stuff that we got from Trick and Mellow. I don't know if it needed three segments, but we had words from your champion, your women's champion tonight and Lyra. Um, what did you think of NXT overall? This actually felt a little bit more aligned with how the main roster functions from a uh, layout point to me. So the problem I've had with NXT for like since the beginning of 2024 actually has been that there's been way too many promos. And I understand that it's a way to build to certain matches. And obviously we have a pay-per-view next week, but I feel like there's way too much talking and like less wrestling. And it's like Ring of Honor. We have the same problem where there's countless number of promos and we have no idea why. So I feel like there should have been a little bit more matches. I do agree with you that the prime target stuff should have been maybe two segments rather than three. And I actually felt like the main event was kind of rushed, like maybe some Something went over because I just felt like everyone was rushing because even they started the brawl and then they went off the air, which I thought was yeah, kind of awkward. A little bit awkward on the pacing tonight. I do think it probably is because this was so promo heavy, but Kimmy, I'll tell you, if you say that you want more wrestling on your wrestling show, they will come for you. I learned the hard <laughs> way. If you're like, I like wrestling on my wrestling shows, they're like, hold on. We like entrances and talking. And I'm like, I like fight them up. So I agree with Kimmy on that. You guys are sending in some great puns and we're going to get to them. But most importantly, my dad chiming in saying, greetings, SDS. Welcome, Kimmy. And howdy to our adopted son, J.W. Pringle. Hi, dad. Thanks for watching my dog last week. And he will be during my time in Philly as well. But let's get into some NXT. There's a lot more people watching now than at the beginning of the show when I did my spiel. So we'll just remind you to get in those super chats and those humper chats if there's anything they wish to question or comment on. We're going to have Corey Brendan here in a couple minutes, but let's get started with um, this, this ratio of a match of, <laughs> of Dijak and Sean Spears and what was a fun match with a different story than I thought that we were going to get. Uh, I really... Really am a huge proponent of Dijak. I think he does such great work from virtually every aspect of it. We didn't see a ton of it tonight, but I feel like in-ring psychology is just one of the strongest things we see. And it was kind of cool because um, we got a swerve tonight. I was expecting Joe Gacy to interfere and cost Dijak the match to put Sean Spears over. But that's not what happened. We had a spot in this match where Sean Spears had his chair, and Joe Gacy from under the ring takes it away in aid of Dijak, which was an interesting little twist. You never know what this Joe Gacy is up to. I kind of like this iteration of him, but this ends with Spears catching a kick, but Dijak hits a super kick for a second try and lands the feast, your eyes for the finish. The thing that always impresses me so much about Dijak is he does things like go up for these massive German superplexes, we saw him jumping from way up high a couple weeks ago. Um, his size and agility combined never ceased to amaze me. Like they, they really, I feel like we're saying that more and more about like big guys moving for their size, but because it's 
it's not just that he's a big dude. Like, he presents as a big dude. So when he just does these kind of things off the top rope or the stuff that demands more agility, you it's almost sneaky. You almost forget that it's there. But um, I really liked this opener. Corey Brennan uh, put it in the select rundown that this was going to open the show. I thought it was really good. And I like that Dijak got a win. He should look strong going into what we find out later is going to be a triple threat match for the North American title, which very excited that he's getting that shine. Um, kind of weird that Sean Spears is taking a loss this early in things, but now it seems like he's going to be preoccupied with Joe Gacy. This went a different way that I was expecting. It was relatively clean outside of a spot where Joe Gacy was equaling the playing field, right? He took a chair away from Sean Spears, which he's the chairman. We know a secret weapon kind of loved this opener, really refreshing stuff. In my opinion, what did you think? I love the match. I also agree with you that I wasn't expecting Gacy to take the chair because, you know, Gacy and Dijak have been feuding for most of 2024. So you yeah. would assume that, like, they would continue that feud. And then at the towards the middle of the show, we saw Gacy drop the chair from the top of the PC to just prove that Joe Gacy is so unpredictable. But I agree with you, too, that Sean Spears taking a loss after just coming back, like, two or three weeks ago is a little shocking. But I'm assuming that they're going to do Spears versus Gacy at Stand and Deliver and maybe that's where he'll get like a bigger win on a bigger show but yeah great way to open the card and yay die jack for getting inserted into a triple threat match at the standard deliver pay-per-view we do love that he has been a stalwart of that brand and he's been so valuable in um just when he loses the way he takes losses i feel like nobody really shines on nxt more than die jack in a stipulation match if you told me that die jack versus dragon off was your match of the year last year. I couldn't argue with you on that. Like it was, it was pretty brilliant the way that that whole match was laid out and executed. Um, I've heard him talk about how sometimes it's like just the amount of time you get with a stipulation match that lets you tell a story so fully. So I, um, I really enjoy that aspect of what Dijak does and I'm very excited. He's going to be getting this title match, but really fun opener. As you said, we'll talk about Joe Gacy at his chair later. Definitely feels like we're setting up with Joe Gacy and uh, and Sean Spears. And I kind of liked that because I was expecting this to be a three-match feud between Gacy and Dijak. And I think Dijak won both of the first two, right? So there's not like a call for a third match. So why not pivot? That is a fun way to go about things. I'm not used to NXT booking making sense. Makes me a little suspicious and itchy because Alex isn't here to tell me how it doesn't make sense. But... I mean, Moving to into be the fair, we're not used to Ring of Honor booking making sense either. It's true. It's very true. But, you know, this brand has champions around, so a little bit different of a situation. But moving into the familiar territory of things to be sour about, this Roxanne promo, well produced, makes sense. I just don't buy Roxanne as a heel yet. But we do get this. Uh, Roxanne produced video package here with her saying that she was watching old video of herself and talking about how she was so naive it made her sick um she wanted everybody to like her and it was pathetic she was a gullible little girl who took pics with her favorite stars and tried to do everything right and now she's only looking out for herself uh the proof is in the results and she's in a title match at stand and deliver and by breaking the rules and doing it her way uh, she doesn't like or dislike Lyra. She doesn't really think anything about Lyra. She's just a woman holding her title barely that stand to deliver. She's going to be there where she belongs. Now, there's good and bad to this, in my opinion. The good is Roxanne says a lot of things that make sense in this version of her. The bad is the things that she's saying make sense are the terrible booking that she had for pretty much all of 2023. She didn't lose her title. She was right about that. She got put in this multi-person match where she didn't really get to do anything as a part of the story. She had opportunities that she wasn't able to capitalize on, and they just did nothing with her for a really long time. I love rooting for Roxanne, so this is hard for me to get behind this heel turn. She doesn't feel like a heel to me. She feels very easy to root for. And when she talks about being like a naive underdog baby face, I'm like, well, yeah, because that's what you you kind of are by nature. And like WWE loves underdog baby faces so much, like to a sickening point. But there's some people that do it really well. And Roxanne, to me, is one of them. 
Uh, Sami Zayn is one of them, right? Like there's people that this archetype belongs to. I also understand NXT is developmental and you probably want to see both sides of the coin from a performer, especially one that'll probably be called up sooner than later, I would guess. Um, but how did you feel about this Roxanne promo tonight? I liked it because you, I think the thing is like, this was supposed to be Cora Jade, right? This was supposed to be yeah, Cora it Jade. Definitely was. So they had to pivot. So that's what I keep telling myself, like, okay, like this was supposed to be Cora. They had to think of something, go to old reliable, dig up the Roxanne match storyline. But I honestly feel like Roxanne should have been called up around like SummerSlam in 2023, just because they literally have nothing for her to do anymore, which is the only reason why I justify the heel turn. But I did like that she was like cutting up the pictures. I was like, okay, now you're really digging into this heel turn. And honestly, there's a part of me that wants her to win next week. And I don't know why. Because I'm like, I want you to go to the main roster. I want you to like spread your wings and fly and show us the Roxy that you were in TNA and Ring of Honor. But I, I, I feel like they're going to like pull the trigger and have her win. I don't know. I think they are. And I actually don't hate that for a few reasons. One, I think the WWE women's division, and I can't believe I'm saying this, is like in desperate need of refinding itself. Um, largely because of the women's tag title picture. It makes absolutely no sense what they've done with any of it. For the second year in a row, it looks like the tag titles are not going to be defended at WrestleMania. You cannot tell me you value a title if it's not being defended at your biggest show of the year so that we can get this triple threat on the card. I understand you need to have Bianca Belair on your card. That makes plenty of sense. Um, I don't know if there's a place for Roxanne if they're not calling her up into the Bailey storyline. And I don't think they are because it feels like Bailey's going to go it alone. So I think strapping Roxanne up is good. I don't think she needs a super long title reign. I think they owe it to her compared to what happened with her last year. Um, so I, I'm glad. I feel like Tiffany's up there right now. They're going to probably put Jade into more regular action sooner than later. Let some people kind of refine their footing. Let's see what this tag division has. Candice LeRae is on this insane heel turn. Like, let's let people settle in before we call Roxanne up because I would like for Roxanne to have something to freaking do on the main roster when she gets there. She's too damn good. And I also think they want to see where she lands. Like, I, I, I feel like that's the whole purpose of this heel turn. And I was against them turning Braun Breaker heel, and then he ended up being a better heel than face, in my opinion. So... Let's see what this ride is. I kind of want her to win. And and Kimmy, I feel like um, the reason I want her to win is because she's right. She got screwed for a year on this. Um, any any thoughts on heel versus face, Roxanne? Do you have like an inclination one way or the other? I feel like we're so used to the baby face that like I need to like sink into the heel a little more sure. because when it came to even like I don't mention I don't want to bring up Ring of Honor again but when it came to like that inaugural women's tournament I remember Maria Canella saying to me like who do you want to win and I said Roxy and she won so until Maria's gonna tell me otherwise I'm just saying I I, I helped make that decision. That's no, that is you booked it as far as I'm concerned, but My it's very telling to me because the only time I've ever heard mixed reactions for Willow Nightingale was when she was facing Roxanne and ROH. Like, that's and that the only crazy. time I've ever heard, which is nuts. Like, that's how likable and over Roxanne can be if she's pushed with something to support it. Now, I will also say that I feel like the prodigy is probably one of the easiest characters that you can pivot, heal, or face, and I don't think that they've leaned into that aspect of it and if she's still gonna call herself the prodigy i want to see her call herself the prodigy as a cocky heel like if she's gonna stand on her stuff like let her stand on her stuff um so those are my thoughts anyway but we got kim greg chiming in here saying from one kim to another welcome kimmy well there you go kim greg always so supportive of us her and her son Bo, like are always just the best just the best. Ryan Sullivan saying, all right, Kimmy, best impression go. Now, impressions are a big part of the show with Alex. Do you have any impressions whatsoever? No, no. I'm not putting you on the spot. You don't have to. It's not like a requirement. We're just really fucking weird. So <laughs> I have one impression. Alex has like 47. And I do my one Tiffany Stratton impression. And that's about it. So... <laughs> You guys are killing it with the puns. Please keep those coming in. We've got some more NXT to get through here, but uh, a good 
move we will see if they give Roxanne the title. But we move on to Thea Hale and Jasmine Nix in uh, what I think was an interesting kind of way to go about this that, that ended up in Thea Hale looking strong. So that was good. Um, and Jasmine Nix looking all right in this. Some weird stuff in this, as NXT is prone to, though. But this opened really hot with Thea Hale um, just kind of, like, unleashing on Nyx with crossbodies. And she eventually kind of gets kicked back into the corner and a half-and-half half suplex, which is my second favorite suplex of all suplexes. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, and I have a list of favorite suplexes. But at the end, we get Nyx going into a body scissors submission. Which I liked. I like that Nick seems to have a hybrid style of being able to do some more submission-based stuff as well as kind of some more traditional American wrestling, I guess. Um, but JC goes to throw in the Chase U towel. And my thing about this was she went to throw in the towel when Nix was on top. Like she threw it in at a time where her person was winning. And I don't know what the miscommunication was there, but that makes absolutely no sense to throw in the towel when not only is your person not in unbearable pain, they're winning the match from what I remember and saw and took notes on. Um, but you have Riley catching it and the ref tossing Chase U from ringside. And then back in the ring, we have Thea Hale getting a two count, standing up to face JC. And uh, she says that they thought they were friends and she smacks her. I like the intensity we get from Thea Hale here. And Nyx goes to roll her up, but we get an arm bar from Thea Hale, who continues to grow and look really good in the ring. Um, we're going to talk about... There's a nice PK in this, too. I'm a big PK gal. I like a good penalty kick. I'm a ZSJ stand. That's probably where it comes from. But, like, just kicking somebody's block off makes me really happy. Um, we'll talk about the post-match in a second. But this match was decent. It was a good showing for, for Jasmine Nix. Thea Hale continues to kind of flourish here. I just, like, the pivotal moment is the I'm going to throw in the towel moment. And if that gets botched, I feel like the whole thing falls apart. Uh, so that was kind of a bummer to me. I didn't love that, that, like, kind of the climax of the match got kind of screwed over by J.C. Jane's timing on this, it seemed like. Um your thoughts on the match and am I right in this towel spot? It felt like it came at the wrong time. <laughs> no, you're a hundred percent right. I was like so confused because I was like looking down. I looked up and I was like, why is there a towel and why are people throwing it and catching it? Like what is happening? But for the match itself, I'm a very big Thea Hale fan. I think that she's super impressive, especially being really young. I think that she's a way better baby face than a heel. So very excited that she's back with Chase U, but I didn't like the towel spot. I just thought the whole thing should have never happened. And then it was chaotic after the match because everyone got involved. Everybody did get involved. And let's talk about what happens post-match here. We had JC Jane attacking Thea Hale after the bell and Hale batting her away a little bit. Then Kiana James and Izzy Dame come in to attack Thea Hale. As she gets backed up by Fallon Henley and Kalani Jordan, who looked great. Um, and it becomes three on three. I gotta say, they unified the tag titles to do what? Like, it would be so much better if there were tag titles in something like this. And quite frankly, like, they sent them up to the main roster to not do that much. In fact, they sent them up with our favorite spooky Scottish witches who are doing nothing up there. We've got nothing for Isla Dawn uh, and Alba Fire going on. So that's kind of frustrating to me. This melee made sense. Everybody's got heat with everyone, which is good. Um, I also, to your point, I like what we're going to get at Thea Hale. I love um, the more grounded version of her that we get in these moments. Like everybody loves really like hyped up Thea Hale. I've been liking the more sincere side that we've seen of her. I've been liking the part that feels like a human being and not, uh, as Joel Pearl calls it, sentient cocaine. Like we don't, <laughs> we don't need personified cocaine here. Um, but NXT is a wacky little world, so I've accepted that. But I like when we get like grounded intensity from from Thea Hale. What did you think of this post match? Are you kind of thirsty of like where did the tag titles go if they're never going to be around or defended on pay per views and on the main roster? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming this is going to be set up for, like, a, maybe a six-woman.
Is it my internet or oh. Kimmy's? Hey, Kimmy's back, I think. Yes. Rare, uh, rare W for my internet. My internet's normally the worst. <laughs> Listen, it's like so spotty. Yesterday, I was doing another podcast, and StreamYard took me twenty minutes to get in, and I was like, "No." Anyway, so yeah, I think we're getting to six woman tag. I agree with you with the tag titles. I don't know what they're doing. Like you said, I don't think they're going to be defended on Mania, and if they weren't going to use them at WrestleMania, just keep them in NXT and just have them all fight for that. I really thought they were going to float across all three brands, and they don't really seem to make it at NXT. Very often, except for I think the the one time when uh, we had the Kabuki Warriors come down to defend them. But speaking of showing up on brands, I threw the challenge at Corey. I said, it looks like you weren't a coward this week. Do you want to come on and talk about your huge scoops week, which Corey did have. He had a lot of information for you guys, a lot about Carmelo Hayes, a lot about tonight's show. And so I said, hey. You want to come on and talk about that and give some context to your scoops. And he said, why would I want to sleep at like three in the morning my time? I would love to come over and do that. So we're going to welcome Corey Brennan on right now. Uh, thank you for not ducking me. Thank you so much. Ducking uh, you. Yeah, that would be very cowardly. It would be very cowardly. We do fight them ups here, Corey Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, how are you? I'm fine. I had a lot of energy, actually, despite the time. But other than that, yeah, fine. <laughs> oh, okay. You have a lot of energy. Well, why don't you get some of that energy out by taking victory laps on your scoops? Because you had a big week. We found out some great stuff about Carmelo Hayes, which I think most people saw coming. But nice to have that confirmation because despite what the internet says, you actually do get confirmation. You can't just yeah. go off of vibes. A lot of stuff about tonight, including the, uh, the opening match that we got and uh, Natalia the boat being the one to answer Lola Vice's challenge. Corey, give us some juice. <laughs> um, well, really, the big thing tonight, obviously, was Rich Holland. The, everyone's, well, my DMs exploded, my notifications exploded <laughs> immediately the minute this man cut his promo. And um, early, early kind of thing that, well, not early, the report should be coming to FIFA Select very soon on it. Uh, the cliff notes of it are. Ridge is not going anywhere. It's storyline. It's all part of the larger story that they've been telling for weeks, if not months now, with Ridge in NXT. They've been building this storyline up for quite a while. It's obviously a very important storyline to Ridge, to Shawn Michaels. And a lot of people have questioned if this storyline is something that's received pushback, whether it's from Ridge or Shawn or anyone else in the back. And I'm honestly surprised that to say that there's been zero pushback within NXT from Ridge. Ridge has actually been a big supporter of this storyline. He was very motivated to do this storyline for a lot of reasons. But I think one I think now this is this isn't a report this part. This is my my opinion. I, I think he he really does want to prove to people like look like I I am very aware of my mistakes that I've made but I am trying to be better just like every other person is and I think it's a great story to tell and I'm happy that they are doing it. At first I wasn't a fan of it. I won't lie. I didn't like that they were flying in the face of something that was largely negative. But I feel like Ridge has become infinitely more interesting since doing this storyline and I'm actually looking forward to seeing what comes next in it. Yeah, so I felt like there's no way this had to be real because you don't leave a microphone in the ring when you retire. You leave your no. boots in the ring. You don't dress this snazzy. Ridge looked great out there tonight. You come out in your gear and you cry, I feel like, is what happens. But this is a part of the bigger story, and it hasn't been my favorite. I've been very transparent about that. But, um, you know, it, that's a matter of taste. I can't say it isn't a sound storyline and that it hasn't been well executed in the way that it's been told for the most part. Uh, it's just not something that that is for me. But if I'm a big believer of and an artist wants to do something and the people involved want to do it, they should do it because it's not for me. It's probably for someone else. That's how art works. So yeah. good to hear that. Um, I did not like the crowd reaction tonight because no. that was this crowd does go into business for themselves quite a bit as pretty much any repeat crowd does when ROH was taping in one place. You would see that happen a lot. But the way that they were receiving the promo, I felt like was something that was very off to me. Um, but I, I had kind of assumed this was storyline. I appreciate your clarification for that. And I'm sure there will be a written form of that and plenty more details on FightfulSelect.com for you guys to subscribe. 
best five dollars in the biz. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. And Corey is killing it with NXT scoops, including the news that Carmelo Hayes is likely getting called up after Stand and Deliver slash WrestleMania season. No surprise to pretty much anybody. I think they have seen him appear on the main roster. They've seen him appear um, in Royal Rumble. He's done just about everything that you could in NXT. Uh, your thoughts or any more details that you want to give on the Carmelo Hayes probable call-up, we'll call it. it I think that, um, sorry, not that I think. It's been a kind of a long road for Melo to get to the main roster. Obviously, we've seen him appear on Raw. We've seen him appear on SmackDown. And uh, when I did, when that report did go live, a lot of people were like, well, is he not already called up? And to answer that question, no. When an NXT, NXT star goes up for those small little, small little runs where they're either on main event or they're in some kind of tournament, like, for example, Carmelo was involved in the US title tournament, that's more than the creative of, of both NXT and the main roster working together to kind of just test the waters and see if the person is ready. Obviously, Melo proved himself multiple times in while he was on the main roster. And, of course... Trick did as well. Trick proved that his popularity transitions not only from NXT but to the main roster. Obviously, he had that SmackDown appearance where he had the entire crowd going insane for him, and that was his first time ever on the main roster. So there's been talk about both of them going up together after Stand and Deliver, but the one, the one that is clear as day is definitely happening at some point after Stand and Deliver and early summer. It is going to be mellow. I haven't heard anything on which brand he's going to be on and um, probably won't find out that until probably the night of stand and deliver because that's usually when these these talents will get do get told we've all seen it on uh breaking ground and so on if a talent's going up they are told they're on the, the night of their last show so that might be when we'll find out more on that um as for stand and deliver itself like you said a uh, lot of news on that as well uh Trick and Carmelo currently are positioned to main event the show. It is not 100% locked in yet. It is not guaranteed. There are still some people who do hope, do want the NXT Championship match between Tony D'Angelo and Aya Dragunov to main event. But because, of course, Tommaso Ciampa said it best in uh, the last video package that they showed tonight. It is one of the biggest matches in NXT history, and they very much do feel that way backstage. So, yeah. We'll see. We'll see if that does end up getting locked in. But once I do hear if it is locked in, obviously that'll be coming to five to select as well. Sure, guys, get in your super chats and humper chats if you have any questions for Corey. Any additional clarity for subscribers who have read those reports? But one thing that we also saw today was Dijak ratioing Sean Spears at the beginning of the show, which you had said was um, set to kick off. The show on Fightful Select, but we later find out, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, that Dijak is going to be in a triple threat for the North American title. Um, I know Obafemi has been received very well backstage. We are huge fans of Obafemi on the show. He's just been lightning in a bottle since he has had like one match and one really cool vignette where we saw him like shot putting couches, which was like the coolest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. Then he went away for like months and came back, um, and he's been excellent. Uh, any any additional news on on Obafemi? I just I'm a huge fan of the guy. It sounds like things are going well backstage. It it one thing that one person did tell me was that he's very easy to produce. He's someone that is very receptive to production producers' ideas. He is someone who's not afraid to pitch ideas, even though he's so new to the the sport in general compared to like. Obviously, you've got the likes of Spears in NXT, who's a veteran of the sport. Like, so Oba is someone who I don't see coming up for a while. I don't see them rushing him whatsoever. I think they realize how how much potential he does have. Like I said, someone like multiple people told me that he was a future WWE champion. He was a future uh, star. Uh, has total package, everything, and like. And I think that's why they did pair him with Dijak. Uh, Dijak, obviously, is one of, if not the cleanest talents in NXT, just in terms of ring IQ, work, his promo work, his social media work, all of that is just perfect from him. So I think that's a large part of why that's his next uh, program. Briggs is also someone who's getting... Briggs is starting to get a lot of attention since breaking up with Jensen. 
um, that's something that a lot of people have talked about backstage is how, how much that Briggs is get starting to get get the attention of not only fans but uh, other talent uh, officials. Everyone's kind of taking notice that okay, Briggs might be might be someone who could have a lot of potential as a singles act. And and I do agree with them. He's he's very. I think he's very talented, and I think he's he showed that tonight, especially in this match. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of growth from him, and it's been good to see because sometimes you know, Gigi and JC, I feel like their split didn't lead to what maybe we were hoping for, kind of. So it's nice to see when they do choose to split someone up, where it feels like they're both thriving and and kind of come along for the better in that regard, and. I think um, the more reps we've gotten to see from Briggs, the better. And yeah. I'm I'm like the biggest Duke Hudson fan in the world. So <laughs> I was very excited about tonight's match in general. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions that I wanted to pick your brain about. If there's anything else that you want to, to mention here, Corey, feel free to. Um, you guys were mentioning uh, Roxanne and Cora earlier, how uh, Roxanne has kind of seemed to have filled Cora's role. But I've actually heard something a little different. Before Cora's injury, there was a, a couple of pitches uh, for um, for Cora and Roxanne to actually reunite together as a heel tag team. That Once it became clear that Roxanne was going to be turning heel, at, because this has been something that's been building for a while, uh, they did actually consider turning her heel a lot earlier around Halloween Havoc, but they pushed it back. So I do think that Roxanne was someone who was going to team with Cora and they were going to kind of come back as uh, mean girls do it together because as everyone sees on their social media, they are still very close friends as much as they might want to, us to believe they aren't. Uh, so that would be something that would, that would have been very interesting to see. And I'm probably going to... Um, have something on Fight for Select soon on just all the all the kind of stories that have kind of been pitched and just didn't go that way at some point. So yeah, keep an eye out on Fight for Select. Keep an eye out on Fightful Select indeed. That's good to know about Roxanne. I felt like we were starting to get flavors of that in the Blair Davenport feud and then it kind of went away and now it seems to have circled back with Roxanne. Uh, they do seem to lean heavily into the Mean Girls trope and women's wrestling and NXT. So not surprising yeah. to hear that that was the direction they were going to go. But Corey, we thank you so much for your scoops. Guys, subscribe to FightfulSelect.com. Best $5 in the biz. You'll get Corey's NXT news in addition to everything that Sean is posting every other damn day of the week. Um, there's also going to be alternate post shows throughout WrestleMania week with Alex Pulaski, who's normally on the show. But your NXT review will be live on the main feed. I think I'm going to be on that. We'll definitely pull Corey onto that, whether he wants to be or not. Uh, he's <laughs> offered, but uh, I would just have to call him a coward again if he was like, ah, I don't know. So we appreciate you. Um, and keep an eye out as we're going into WrestleMania week for more from Corey. Uh, just before I do go, I did forget to mention, I don't know how I forgot to mention this, but the power slam that Braun pulled off, uh, yes. the Doomsday device, that... that when I asked about that, well, it wasn't wasn't so much as me asking as me reacting. Basically, the same thing I tweeted: "Holy shitting shit, uh, Braun!" <laughs> and I got, and the response that I got was, "That was pretty much what everyone said backstage." That's kind of the reaction that I got. People were blown away by Braun not only doing it but pulling off pulling it off to the point that it the way it looked. Personally, when I saw, it, I thought Braun had broken his neck nearly. I was very scared at first the way he took that, but when they showed it back is when I noticed how he did it so cleanly. And honestly, Braun is like Fraser, gets a lot of comments about his speed and his intensity, especially when he hits the ropes. That's I'm like I don't I don't, I'm not surprised. But uh yeah, I just wanted to get that part in um before I did leave because I completely forgot. Someone mentioned it in the chat. I'm not sure who did, but thank you to the person who did. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go and try to get some sleep. But you guys enjoy this. It was nice talking to you, Kimmy. Nice to meet you for the first time. I didn't, I barely said two <laughs> words to you. Hello. Hi. We, Hello. <laughs> we dove in. We dove in right away. Um, Corey, thank you for that. Yeah, Bron, really impressive. I got to say, I understand 
like how great he is and valuable he is a, as a singles wrestler, but Braun in these multi-man matches, yeah. this whole run with Baron Corbin, who I think has been very helpful for him with his experience. And when he's been in trios matches with like the creeds or other people, like I love seeing Braun in those contexts. And I think it gives him a little bit of freedom to almost keep the gas tank really full until he wants to let it go rather than have to pace out a singles match. And boy, oh boy, he's a blast to watch. So Thank you so much to Corey. Subscribe to Fightful Select for more NXT news every Tuesday and throughout the week as we learned with this Carmelo story. So some good stuff there. And we will definitely see him on as we get to the road to stand and deliver uh, hosted by the metaphor, which we found out as well. So uh, Corey, go get some rest. We'll see you on the next one. All right, guys. Peace. Yeah, see like just we have too many nice people for the show today. <laughs> I didn't know it's I was supposed to be valid. mean. I don't know. We're not supposed to be mean, but it is sour grass. And just every Corey's just like, he's just like talking to a hug. You know what I mean? It's just like, he's very sweet. So we're going to have to bring back the sour and we're going to do it right now. As we talk about trick and Mel, there's actually not a whole lot of bad to say, except for this did not need three segments probably, but it was really interesting. This was the, prime target uh video package that we got today and what i loved about this was how far out of the way they went to get all of these different perspectives from main roster stars if alice flasky were here he would say yeah but they didn't really say a whole heck of a lot in all three of these and he would be right um but there were still some things that i appreciated about it just didn't feel like it needed three entire segments when we had like a five minute match with your actual champion but we have some good stuff in here we get uh uh, Booker T talking about Mello's rise and how it couldn't have happened without Trick and that Trick was by Mello's side and seeing him get awards without his name on it. He makes a champagne wishes and caviar dreams reference because of course he does. We hear Orton saying that Carmelo heard people reacting differently to Trick and I liked that Punk kind of put an, an exclamation point on that same notion and talked about how like this is just kind of human nature one guy is going to get jealous of the other and vice versa um and we get mellow kind of capping a lot of this off by saying he remembers when trick was saying he was bad about it but he couldn't be lying through his teeth kind of anymore he was eating off of his place this was never a we thing it was a me thing and that his 15 minutes are up so the first one was interesting to me because we kind of got the words in Carmelo's own way here. And we also got some perspectives from Booker and Orton and Punk, um, which I thought was was nicely done. What did you think of the first chunk of these? I liked the first one. The second one was my favorite, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But the first one was really good because I didn't expect them to get like all these people from the roster. Because I feel like we never see like the yes. big stars from the roster doing this. It's always just like a legend or two, and then most of the people in the NXT roster, and then Shawn Michaels. But we like Cody was in this and Punk and Ciampa and Orton, which I know everyone was like, How did Randy Orton get in this? How did they like convince him to go and do this thing for NXT but <laughs> that was literally all over my Twitter feed was like Randy Orton what but yeah this was it was really good the first and second part I feel like were like the main ones but the third part I felt like really didn't need to be there because it was three segments but yes agree the third part was definitely superfluous we have Alex Pulaski in the chat saying what did I miss well you missed Dijak ratioing Sean Spears, Alex. Whoops, that was the chat below. And you missed Ridge Holland retiring, but not really retiring, which you can rant about next week. You're going to want to. I know my host, and he's going to want to rant about Ridge Holland retiring, but not retiring. But the second chunk of this prime target promo. Oh, and Alex, you missed Duke Hudson being great. But... Trick is in South Philly with his family, which was a really nice touch. I like that we tied the Philly connection into this going in to Mania. Uh, he says he stayed with his uncle James, who is there. And he says James will be in attendance in Philly, and it's a special city to him. City of brotherly love, and he thought that Mello was his brother. Booker says that Trick knows it's about getting back up to fight, and Punk says when you get stabbed in the back, the brother's knife is the deepest um, some good stuff here. I liked the sincerity of the, the second chunk of this. The third was just to, it felt like to get Johnny Gargano back on NXT, to be honest. But 
you got trick at the end of the saying mellow i'm coming for you which i i liked um and i liked punk also saying like when something monstrous is done to you you risk a monster coming back at you feels like sam punk might be qualified to say something like that but i agree with you i feel like the second one was like a nice blend of something real life and sincere to give it kind of that docu-series feel and then also um to have those additional perspectives in there and i like trick getting to say his piece in the second bit of this because Melo said his piece in the first good indicator you don't need a third one when both guys have already said their piece but what did you think of the second chunk of this so the second part i felt like the main thing was like i love like when you're trying to sell a baby face and it's like the hometown and the family like that's how you get people to like you and back you and they did a tremendous job in selling this i had no idea that he had so many connections to philly either so i got to learn something and i like learning things on my wrestling oh, programming <laughs> i i know right who am i but the third part i felt like was just yeah i want this person to win this person to win that person to win and i'm like you could have saved that for like next week or even like i'm assuming they're going to make a bigger video package going into stand and deliver like that they're going to show before the match because i don't think they're going to show this prime target thing before the match so like you could have saved it for that instead but yeah i th i like that they do these on nxt i think jeremy borash was one of the best things to go do the production stuff but very good segment no no need for three parts though I said it last week and I'll say it again. Uh, it is very weird to me in NXT that we either get slickly high level produced cinematic movies or we get cheesy after school special backstage stuff that feels like it's a high school after school special. It's so weird to me that it feels like we have two completely different wrestling shows <laughs> happening at once. But the third part, the part of this, as we said, was kind of superfluous. But we do have Johnny Gargano saying that he doesn't know if you ever get back what you lose in um, the kind of match that they are going to have. Uh, and Ciampa says it's one of the biggest matches in NXT history. Very, very generic. And then you just kind of have Melo saying that you don't know what it's like to be the face of a brand for two years and be responsible for selling tickets, doing media, and being him. So uh, I guess Melo getting the last word felt like they could have. I'm always a big believer in like, more time for women's matches or i don't know you had your nxt championship in like a five minute match you probably shouldn't need much more than that to put away stacks but um not a ton to say about the third one here if there's anything you want to add feel free i like that like the last thing that was said was like we're gonna go to war and you know i know that Corey said it i know they said it here like this feels like a very big match i i definitely hope this main events like i think that they both deserve it i think this is the match that everyone is mostly invested in so no, Kimmy, the main event should be the title. I'm one of those people. Oh, you're one of those? <laughs> no. I am one of those. I am, in general, I'm one of those. I also just feel like, I. it feels to me like Dragunov's title reign has been swallowed by the Trick and Mellow stuff because so many of his defenses were tied up in this story. He's obviously going to be Tony D'Angelo, but I just want his championship reign to get the recognition that it deserves because I think Ilya Dragunov is one of the best ever, 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 ever to do it um and definitely one of the best going right now guys get in your super chats get in your humper chats we're gonna get to your puns in a minute here but before we do that kimmy yes i bet that you're right okay i bet that carmelo and trick do end up closing the show but if i want to bet on something i need to be educated in my odds kimmy okay I need somewhere like Bet Online AG, who I believe had betting odds on whether Pornhub was going to get banned in Alabama, if I read John's Twitter correctly. So it's not just wrestling, it's not just traditional sports that you can bet on on Bet Online AG. Sean's going to tell you more about it. Hey guys, I'm here to tell you about betonline.ag, the official betting partner of Fightful. It's not just an online platform. They've been trusted for over 25 years. They boast a focus on the player approach and have built their reputation on offering their clients nothing but the best. From cutting edge technology to enticing promotions and the latest sports betting odds. Whether it be wrestling, MMA, boxing, or Football, baseball, basketball, or racing, anything you can think of. 
All major sporting events are covered by betonline.ag. Fast payouts, highest credit card acceptance industry-wide, safe and secure online environments, and their live betting feature allows you to bet on your favorites weekly and easily and in real time. BetOnline.ag. That's where we're going at Fightful. That's where we suggest you go as well. That's where we get all of our odds at. BetOnline.ag. Only bet what you can and please bet responsibly. Kate, you're muted. There you go. Always does that coming out of an <laughs> ad, ad break. I feel like it's Sean pulling a rib on me somehow every single time, but Bet Online AG has been wonderful to us. Please let them know you found out about them through us. Uh, if you have Twitter, just shoot them a message and be like, hey, I found out about you from Fightful. If you're not a betting person, if you are a betting person, what the heck are you doing? Head over to Bet Online AG. You just heard about all the benefits from it right there for you. But guys, we're working our way through tonight's episode of NXT. Please leave a thumbs up on this video, but let's get into some of your puns. We had boat puns. Didn't fully think through about the events of today before we announced that, but you guys seem all right with it. So thank you so much. We've got Ricardo saying Steamboat Willie Mac, which I appreciate. Also a 37 month member of Fightful. Thank you so much for that. The Yacht Rockers, which I like very, very much. Thank you so much for that. Our resident clever Tegan Knox pun person, Tegan sitting by the Knox of the Bay, which is excellent. Uh, Tug Bar- Bo and his tag partner, the Shark, very nice. Tegan Knotts, that was a very nice one. Shout out to Gemini season, which I appreciate. Uh, Trawler Team 2000. Look, this guy's name is Ian R. Kimmy. I've decided it's Ian Riccoboni. And it's not, but it is. And happy they wrestling, been, everybody. Happy wrestling, indeed. And uh, I'm also, for some reason, Techno Team 2000 is just like my forbet- forgettable tag team that I always stand. And they always send in Techno Team 2000 fun. So thank you so much for that. Tom Valley saying the Motorboat City Machine Guns. Very nice. Very nice. I appreciate that one. ENR with my other stands, Zach Skipper Jr., Boat Bullocks, as we would say, with ZSJ, <laughs> Fairy Funk, which is a very good one. I appreciate that. Or Boat Femi, which is great from Sefa. The Young Bosses, <laughs> and the Jericho, <laughs> the Jericho Poop Deck. Darn it. That's very good and funny. That one I wish Alex was here for, but. Ian Rick and bon- Bonnie coming back with Speedboat Mike Bailey, a very good one. I appreciate that. Uh, what else we got? We got Meet Normous with Rowboat Femi, <laughs> Natty the Boat, of course, and Thea Gale Force wins. Gale Force wins is an excellent deep cut. I appreciate that. Also, Meet Normous saying Catalina Mixer Punk, no wine. He's straight edge. That's right. But as Drew McIntyre told us yesterday, does spend a lot of time in rehab for somebody who's straight edge. Mr. Bandana Head saying the Miz and Mast. Awesome. Very nice. The title chief is very good. And Robo Reigns. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is very good. In honor of guest Kimmy Solis. Safety of life at sea. It's a Navy term. Well, thank you so much for making our guest Kimmy feel welcome here. These are also creative. Damn. They are the best. We got we did a real estate week and they had like Bam Bam Bungalow and Zillow Nightingale. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievably creative group that we have here. Louisville with the Gorilla Pot <laughs> That's so good. Fairy Saturn. Under Fairy Saturn. One of the most underrated boats in the world. Go back and watch very Saturn stuff. Bionic sailboat. Very nice. Very nice. Um, you guys are the best. This is so fun. This is normally Alex's to drive. This is so weird. The rated R the superstar is very nice. A little pirate Copeland for you. Uh, this one hurts as the two of us who stand Dalton Castle. But Dalton Castle has lost buoys. Very sad, but very good pun. And Anthony Bow wins. 
just gonna keep praying for that Bowen singles run until it happens. <laughs> we got second lieutenant lieutenant colonel photo saying, "You know it's all about the jib." Boom. <laughs> Very, very good. Uh, what else we got? Gaff Hardy. Who the F is Skip Garrison? <laughs> oh, that's so good. Uh, Kevin Anthony Bowens is excellent. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. And we'll save this one as the last one of the break. Brett, the ship man heart. Chris Pereira, man. There's some of you who kill it peren perennially. And... Chris Pereira is one of them. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Let's get back into some NXT, shall we? Whoops. Boy, thank you. We got plenty more to talk about. Get in more Super Chats and Humper Chats. They don't have to be puns, but we've got some more that came in our way here. Um, we have the Stand and Deliver host auditions. I miss Pretty Deadly doing this last year, but the metaphor are your hosts of Stand and Deliver, which was a good choice. I'm a big Noam Dar fan, so I would rather see him in the ring, but not a bad way to go. Not a bad way to go. Big personalities. Noam Dar is absolutely hysterical. The rest of the group is great and super over in this. Um, so it, a good choice, but I just feel like Noam Dar is one of the best workers that they have on this brand, so I would like to see him wrestling at Stand and Deliver. It kind of feels like he carried the Heritage Cup picture the entire time, and then he dropped it, and they just don't have anything to follow up with for Stand and Deliver. But um, they'll, they'll kill it at the hosting role. I just wish they were doing more. Do you have any thoughts about the metaphor? I want to be in the metaphor so bad, Kimmy. <laughs> but that would make it the meta five. I know. I know. I'm just like, I could probably find, like, I could kick out Oramensa, right? I could yeah. do it. Yeah. He's great on his own. He's an excellent singles wrestler. He doesn't need this group. I do. I need to be in it. <laughs> I did like that Andre Chase was so confident that he was going to get the hosting role. That he was like <laughs> talking. I guess that was supposed to be like a producer he was talking to. And he was like cursing. He's like, I effing nailed it. I don't know if we're allowed to curse on this show. But like, yes. I effing Oh, we are? Amazing. Out of the yeah. five minute mark because we won't get demonetized. <laughs> yes. But yeah, like he was so excited. And then he saw the metaphor come out. He goes, oh, man. But yeah, I mean, if they didn't have anything planned for them to wrestle, I think this makes sense for them. They're going to be loud. They're going to be obnoxious. They have a segment next week with Roxanne and Lyra. So we'll get to see a little taste of what they have in store for Saturday. We Well, we saw some good stuff here. We saw Hank and Tank. We saw references to Taylor Swift. So you know Jeremy Lambert is going to have a write-up on that. But we have some more notes that came in from Corey Brennan since we had him on here uh, about Thea Hale just continuing to impress every match. Uh, her getting better week over week is the backstage reaction to that. Um, Takeaway from the entranceway that has become common since Dunn left is much harder to do with the cameras NXT has may not continue. I don't know what that means. So we're going to skip it. I'm reading these to you as he wrote them. The morale in NXT is at a height. It hasn't been seen in some time with several on the roster and production feeling that the brand is on a roll. So it sounds mostly like good backstage vibes just for how talent is received and the overall product right now, which uh, this is sour grab. So we'll be here to ruin that for everyone, but <laughs> We will get into uh, our next match, which is the boat answering Lola Vice's challenge as reported by FightfulSelect.com. Um, some, some good S talking at the beginning of this from Lola Vice. She's kind of back with a vengeance, which is good because she had her title shot and then was nowhere to be found after Electra Lopez went to the main roster for way too long. She's too good not to be on television, but I will say this match didn't go as smoothly as I, I was hoping for with someone as good as Lola Vice and as good as Natalia Hart is. Um, it feels like Natty is their measuring stick a lot of times in a lot of ways. And I feel like Lola Vice is really good. Just started really slow and clunky, but it kind of settled in as we went on. But I have no idea what the hell the booking for this match was because <laughs> Natalia wins. It's sharpshooter time and we get Lola countering. Uh, and a roll up, and Natty goes right into the arm bar. 
And then we have Lola preventing the extension and getting a two count, but Natty dodges a kick and rolls her up for the win. I have no idea what the heck we're doing. I get Natalia coming down to be the measuring stick. She's one of the best women's wrestlers that you could possibly have, but why is Lola Vice losing to Natalia Hart a week before Stand and Deliver, a week and a half before Stand and Deliver? That makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, I, I'm bummed because my in-ring expectations were high, but I was like, certainly Lola Vice is going to win. What could Natalia Hart possibly have to gain from this? That would be silly and make no sense. Well, they did the silly thing that makes no sense, as is so often the case in NXT to me. Um, but more, the in-ring surprised me with how long it took to kind of to settle in. We we got into grooving a little bit, but um, I, I was I was surprised that this just didn't feel right at the start. What were your thoughts on the match and what the hell was the booking behind this? <laughs> so when um, Carmen came out, I was like, okay, she's going to cost Lola. So it won't be clean if Natty wins. Right. And she didn't, she didn't even get involved. She just stood there and yelled at her for no, like five minutes. So I was like, oh, and then she's like raising Natty's hand. So am I supposed to believe that like they're a duo now? But then like technically like Nat Natalia's with Tegan Knox. So like what what is going on? Again, like th here's a tag team, I guess, that could like challenge for those mysterious women's tag team titles. But yeah, this match is a little bit all over the place. I, I agree with you that I feel like if you could go in the ring with Natalia, then they know that like you're ready to potentially like do some main event stuff like go like or like maybe the live events but yeah really confused of why natalia won if she's not a main staple in nxt as am i this is very odd i don't feel like natalia hart is going to stand and deliver but Corey clarifying what i didn't understand which was the long camera that uh <laughs> that starts at the entranceway and wraps around the ring that makes a little bit more sense and then he said, I am a writer. It should be easier to describe. It's also me who has dyslexia reading it on the fly. So don't, don't take all the brunt of that, Corey. But yeah, this this was extremely confusing to me. I uh, I have no idea why Natalia went over here. And I agree. There was, I'm yelling at you is the lamest distraction in the history of the world. Like the amount of time, well, no someone's music hitting and someone being so paralyzed by the sound of music that they lose the match blows my mind every time that people are that dumb. Uh, but just yelling at you and not doing anything feels like a useless, like NWA, like it feels like baby doll in NWA or something where you're like, you look great and you are doing nothing. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, so no disrespect to baby doll. She did, Sometimes she would like grab someone's leg or whatever. Uh, but the point being, if you're out there to be a distraction, you should probably distract people, right? So I don't know what is going on there. But guys, continue getting those super chats and humper chats. We got boat puns tonight. But if you don't want to do boat puns because sad things happened to Baltimore, solo, I was abandoned puns, single puns, Alex left me puns, whatever you want to do in the vein of so alone but not that alone because we have the wonderful kimmy sokol here so we move into this parking lot segment which man joe gacy genuinely cracked me up in this i gotta say <laughs> uh this was not your typical parking lot segment because nobody was really assaulted which is refreshing and different uh, i also liked that you could see the florida palm trees in this like it felt like florida where they operate out of which was good but we have Sean Spears saying that his loss was disappointing and because of Joe Gacy, who wasn't even on his radar. A very natural line delivery from Sean Spears in this, which I liked. Um, but if he wants to play and Gacy is on the roof and tosses the chair down and he's like, I'm so sorry I forgot to give you this back, <laughs> which killed me. Like Joe Gacy's comedic timing when he's playing someone that is um, like – also insane is actually a very difficult thing to pull off, I think, because like to be funny, but what you actually are is psychotic is that's tricky to do. And I feel like Joe Gacy's doing a really good job of that. Um, but then we have Oba Femi there and he steps on the chair, which is just the more Oba Femi on my screen, the better, because that guy has charisma for days and is ice cold and so cool, calm and collected. But 
an effective thing for Sean Spears. And it seems like we're pivoting to Gacy versus Spears, which I think could be really fun because Joe Gacy is so weird and unpredictable and Sean Spears has, is the chairman, right? So I feel like that's a nice way to pull out Joe Gacy having a deathmatch background with combining it with a PG NXT environment is having somebody who uses a chair as a weapon regularly is, is probably a good call. What did you think of our little parking lot segment there and Joe Gacy throwing a chair from the roof and being like, oh my God, so sorry. I forgot to give this back. <laughs> it's it's like, oh, I apologize. So I have this thing that is yours. And I, I just slipped my mind. No, I love this. It's very different than most parking lot segments we see on this program. So love that no one got assaulted. Well, I mean, the chair Nobody did. Nobody got mugged. Yeah, the, the chair did. That took a bump from the roof. Yeah. <laughs> And then the chair got stepped on. So, I mean, the chair got assaulted if you want to count that. But I think Gacy and Spears should have a good match with Stan to deliver. And if they're going to go that way, because, again, it's not official yet. We don't know what's going to happen with that. But, yeah, good segment. And I'm lucky. I'm happy that they found something for Sean Spears to do. I am, too. I'm happy for Sean Spears in general, being, getting to be consistently on t- television wrestling. Because he's great. And he deserves that. Kim Gray chimed in saying that the camera shot from behind Cody when The Rock came out was amazing, breathtaking from last night. Yes, they did some good work on Raw. And in general, the production changes since Kevin Dunn has left. And I don't feel bad saying that because it doesn't seem like he was like the best dude either to have around. But like really refreshing to see these new settings and new approaches to production. They feel much more modern as much as I love cutting away from things 900 times in a row i don't so <laughs> that's never a good thing when you're just going because i i did production in college and you know it you're not supposed to do that they teach you that in school do not cut 10 million times no and i remember i remember sean saying i don't remember if he said who it was but i think it was somebody had pointed it out that whenever there were like strikes Kevin Dunn would cut 900 times with whatever leg you were striking. Um, And that was supposed to cover up any bad strikes. And they were like, if your strikes are that bad that they can't be filmed, you shouldn't be doing (laughs) strikes. Like, you're not helping at all with that. But we move along from our very weird women's match uh, down the line here. Uh, I'm sorry, from our parking lot segment where nobody got assaulted to a wave metaphor promo. I don't know. <laughs> I think we all know Sol Ruka surfs, right? I think we got the hint. Like, the first ten times they've shown her surfing. Uh, yeah. Uh, we know she surfs, and we got a promo here saying that she was crashed down upon, like, a crest of a wave uh, from Blair Davenport. She did use the word shredded when she talked about her ACL, which I just thought was, like, a very strong verb choice for whoever wrote that so that was good but her being like man (laughs) the crest of the wave comes crashing down on you with all this force i was like come on we know you're a surfer (laughs) look we're very aware but she does allude to the fact that she was out for nine months and that it paused her career and she said that rehab sucked but she's back now and she's pissed off and she is going to snatch blair's soul uh because get it her her finisher is called the Soul Snatcher. A little heavy-handed NXT <laughs> with your wave metaphor. And here's the thing. Those are puns like I make on this show. And I don't, that feels like gimmick infringement to me. If you're going to come out here with your, your quippy little puns, that feels like what I do. Your writing should be better than my cheesy lines on this show. And then in the return promo, we get more, be- we do puns on this show. We got beach puns and metaphors from Blair Davenport saying that Soul is unlikable and reminds her of Sam. Like, that's not how Blair Davenport talks. She does call her annoying and disgusting and say she can't get rid of her and that. I'm like, okay, I get it. Because if you go to the beach, you always need to vacuum your car. That's annoying. I got it. Um, but she says, waste all the time you want with your TikTok dorks, which I appreciated. Uh, And she says, we'll see how well the doctors repaired her ACL because she's going to send Soul on the road to recovery once again. So, uh, look, Soul Ruka, 
catching her tidal waves to deliver a promo is weird enough. When I say it feels like we have two different shows, Kimmy, this is what I mean. You have all the stuff that we had with Trick and Mellow, and then we have this, which feels not that far from Wrestlelicious, which as a lot of people know, I was very into very briefly. Um, like Malibu Barbie delivering a promo thing does not work. Like let her be something other than a surfer. Like, I don't know, a wrestler. <laughs> and Blair Davenport, who's this like, badass who's calm and collected always and just wants to big boot people and ruin their lives should not be like you remind me of sand just like no <laughs> that please can we have our women not feeling so cartoonish but Blair Davenport, Sol Ruka coming back to fight each other I always am a fan of this person put me out I'm coming back to wrestle them uh, that's that when you're coming back from injury you should be looking for that person in my opinion like I like that um, what were your thoughts on the waves we were catching, bro? <laughs> that we were not catching waves, that's for sure. We were catching like anything other than the waves. I the one thing I hate is when they have like a promo about one person and immediately after they're like, boom, okay, here's another promo segment with like the same feud. And it's like, can we break this up a little bit? Like give Blair a chance to like breathe in what Solo was saying, like Soul was saying. Like I feel like that's just so, it's so weird to go back to back. And it's the reason why there's too much talking on this programming, but apparently I'm not allowed to say that according to Kate. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it just at your own risk if you say it on Twitter, because they will light you up if you're like, I would like more wrestling on this wrestling show. People get real mad at you, apparently. <laughs> apparently. I, I've seen those tweets. It was very, very hateful. But I'm excited. Over for a half match. hour of wrestling on a two-hour show doesn't feel like a lot to ask. Come on, I, I know. That, that's kind of it's kind of rough. <laughs> I'm excited for the match, but these promos like tell me that they didn't get bullet points and they just got word for word. Like This is what this showed. Yeah, like, agreed. Wow. Was, like, I'm here to respond to someone who was on the beach already. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. Like, I'm coming after you. Tape of a girl on the beach does not work. That is so corny and weird. So, And for us in the Northeast, like, it's still cold over here. Like, you're making yeah, this us is, jealous. That part's just rude. Yeah, that part's just rude. I agree. I agree with you. But we got... Some more chats coming in from you guys. Some more puns. Uh, Louisville with Orphan Baller for the absent fodder, which I appreciate very much. Uh, and T-Electric Mayhem saying Wheelhouse Hobbs. Very nice. We are the R bar. I missed the bar. And Abaddon Ship instead of Abandoned Ship. They deserve that pun. That's a really good one. Uh, and of course, Ian Riccoboni saying Apollo Cruz right there. Noam Radar which is very good. And the Mizan mess. Very good. These are really good. You guys helping me out in Alex's absence and Kimmy probably wondering what the is going on on the show. Uh, Ian also saying big Papa Bilge pump? B-I-L-G pump? What is that? Yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't know. It's supposed to be it something for Scott Steiner, but I don't know what Bilge is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the boat part. I'll, I'll let the chat tell me because they're so educational. <laughs> Which I appreciate. Keep those silly chats coming. Keep any chats that you want to talk about on the show going as we move right along to Ilya Dragunov and Channing Stacks Lorenzo and him getting invited to the diner. Uh, this was a short match, but a very effective one, I think, because... Ilya Dragunov shouldn't have to do a lot to beat Stax, but the offense he did get in, I thought was actually very good and made a lot of sense. I love technical wrestling so much, Kimmy. So when I see things like Ilya going for an H-bomb and Stax kicking it to stop it and then stomping on Ilya's fingers, my little Tekker heart lights up. I love technical wrestling and I love logical counter wrestling as well. So that made me extremely happy. Uh, but we got a leaping knee and an enziguri to Stax. Ilya getting Stax shoved into the ropes into a German suplex and a power bomb to Dragunov, but a torpedo at Moscow to finish it off. This was short but really effective. And what I loved was 
I think Stax got a lot of really logical survival wrestling in in a very short time, whilst Ilya Dragunov still looks, he just looks so powerful. Like, he looks like he lays everything in so hard. His move set is so befitting of him, and it just feels like every move that he lays in, whether it's something as simple as a leaping knee or something as intensive as, like, the Torpedo Moscow or whatever, Everything feels so efficient with him. Everything feels like it's geared toward winning a match. So I like that what Stax got in made sense and looked effective. And he looked prepared for the match. But Ilya's just a better wrestler than him. This guy's an underling to Tony D'Angelo, right? So um, I appreciated that whilst this match was brief, it felt like it very much fit the story that they were trying to tell. And that they were able to get a pretty comprehensive story in in five minutes and it supports the bigger picture of this tony d'angelo and Ilya dragunov match at the pay-per-view or the ple rather uh did you like this as much as i did yeah i mean they played into this a little bit in the promo that Ilya cut later on where like oh the family did their homework in yes. the match so stax was prepared i mean Stax is kind of newer, I would say, to the NXT roster and performing on TV. So even though this was short, he looked really good. I know his lips were, his lips were busted open too. So we got blood two nights in a row on WWE TV. Who Not gory self mutilation? Who <laughs> would have thought? But yeah, no. and then they got d- dinner. There's a dinner invitation from there the family. Is- it's not the restaurant, though. It's somewhere else. It is a special location. We get Luca Crucifino, who this chat and this program have been asking for to join Tony D for months and months and months. Luis Polito, our moderator, might have been cheering for this for years. But what I love about this segment is we do get Luca uh, saying that Tony wants him to join dinner and hands him an invitation. In the spot that I talked about where he was stomping on Ilya Dragunov's fingers, Ilya Dragunov is selling the entire time. This is a short segment, but he like can't open the invitation because his hand is busted because he just got it stopped on a couple minutes ago. And I love stuff like that. Like when somebody actually cares enough to carry the punishment from the match over into a segment like this, he's holding his hand like it's busted the entire segment and he's audibly wincing in pain when he has to use it, which is what you should do as a wrestler. It makes your opponent look great. And if you beat no, this is like an old Jerichoism that I fully agree with. And I will only bring up Jericho and Alex's absence on purpose. No, but like this idea that if you, if you beat nobody, you didn't beat anybody. If you build up your opponent and you beat them, you look better in the process. So why aren't you building your opponent up? If he beat somebody that actually kicked his ass a little bit, that is more meaningful. It also means he's softened up for Tony D'Angelo, right? So um, some good stuff here. I'm very intrigued about the special location. Where do you think the special location is, Kimmy? Well, I saw in the chat that they were talking about the black envelope. That's not a good sign. So I'm not, I, I have a feeling it's not going to be at a typical restaurant. It's going to be like somewhere in like the corner, like in like a dark alley or something. Like it's not going to be whatever. You think it's the parking lot? Thinks. Somebody could die. I mean,. <laughs> It would be on brand for NXT if it was in a parking lot, let's be real. It would. But it's not going to be in a fancy family restaurant, that's for sure. I can guarantee that. Well, we already saw them on the bridge, so I am interested to see where this is. Because, like, the bridge, the parking lot we've seen some Tony D crimes in. When it was the Legato family, they were on the boat. But I think it was Santos's boat. So I'm very intrigued to see what this special location is. But Luis saying my arm is sore for how much I pumped my fist in the air when he joined the family. Uh, My only problem with Luca Crucifino is he should have, in my opinion, a comic, comically overdone accent. I feel like of anybody, the lawyer of the mob group needs to have the most comically overdone accent. And there's a lot of very cheesy things on the show. And I feel like that should be one of them. I agree with you. I mean, I feel like every time we see it in like a TV or like a movie, like that's that's what it is. Like the lawyer always has like the thickest accent. Like go all the way with this. We'll appreciate it. I promise. It needs to be exactly. It needs to be like one order side character thick. Like it needs to be. It needs to be. 
But we move on to what we kind of already discussed with Ridge Holland, which it does seem as though it's a work. I felt like it was a work the entire time. Uh, but we get Ridge Holland in the ring wearing a suit. First sign it's a work, like I said. If you're retiring, you're leaving your boots in the ring. And he looked great in his suit. Um, but he says it's very hard to come out here and say what he's going to say. He knew this day would come. He thanks uh, Regal and Shawn Michaels and a bunch of other producers and talent in the back. But he says that it's time for him to retire. He knows the perception of him. Um, he doesn't want to keep injuring people. He's had difficult conversations with people who love him and with himself six inches from the mirror. He says... Very sad I don't have a blue chew read tonight. That would have been the perfect segue. But uh, he essentially gives a full retirement speech, but it is a full retirement speech. This is not a Mark Henry gotcha retirement speech. It was a sincere evaluation of, I can't keep doing this if I'm hurting people kind of thing. This storyline has not been for me. I don't like it. I don't like it when... Um, I don't like it when Brian Danielson sells Caesar, Caesar spots. Like I don't love, I oftentimes love when people bring real life stuff into promos. I don't like it when it's like, Hey, this person's career got injured, ended by injury stuff. That's just not for me. Um, but I think I can't really argue that it's not at least decent wrestling creative in the way that it's been presented. The pacing of the way they rolled it out has been a lot of weird, but a little bit weird, but they've had, the stuff with Sean Spears trying to bring the violence out of him. Now we're getting the side of it that he can't really control it. Not my favorite thing in the world, but also um, that is more of a matter of taste than whether the creative is good or bad. That's just like my, my opinion on it. I don't think there's anything that's not fundamentally sound about the way that they're approaching it. Um, some people have had the feedback. I know Alex Pulowski did that. Like it, I'm just not emotionally invested in it, regardless of the, the barrier that I've had. I don't know if this promo helped you get more invested in it tonight, Kimmy, but um, I'm willing to give it a little bit more time to see where it goes. What did you think tonight? I've had mixed reactions from the start because I mean, I do love when wrestling kind of brings like the real life into storylines. And obviously we do know that unfortunately Big E got hurt because of Holland and we don't really know what his future holds. He will be a WWE world though. So that's exciting. Cause I that believe is. he's hosting the slammies. So good for Big E. Let's go. But uh, I need to see where this is going. Like I need the finish line already. Like, I feel like this is already dragged a little bit too long. In my opinion, this isn't my favorite storyline either. And I was actually expecting someone to like interrupt him. Like when he was walking, like to the back, I was like, okay, someone's entrance is going to come because they showed the Titan Tron. And every time they show a Titan Tron in a camera shot, usually someone comes out. So I was really shocked that no one came out for this. But yeah, I just want to see where this is leading to. If, so then I can make my full, okay, this was worth it. Or no, this was really stupid. They should have done something else. I agree with you. This was kind of begging for that. And I think what they're trying to do is like, let us buy into the work by not having someone interrupt. But you were kind of sitting waiting for the guy, whoever it was, to come down and say, no, you're not giving up yet, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, it would be cool if there was a veteran who wasn't doing something on the main roster came back for that, right? Like, if they came back to be like, no, this is not where your wrestling story ends, whatever. But they did just let the full retirement speech play out. And to that, it, I don't love it, but I, I give them credit for let us think this guy actually retired, right? Like, I didn't buy it. Um, but if they want us to buy it, they should probably do that. So they at least did something unexpected here, but I agree. This has been a little bit stuck in the mud. It feels like after the Sean Spears match, it should have evolved in like a, a bigger direction in a sense, um, rather than like that happened. And now we're kind of, now he's retired. It's like a, it's a weird jump to make. So I don't know. I don't know. But we need the finish line, whatever it is, whoever's going to be the one to like talk them out of it. Just get there. Let's get there. <laughs> Let's see who that is. Cause Sean Spears talked them into it. Right. So um, Sean Spears was like, I want to bring the violence out of you. Who's saying that Rich Holland can stick around and control it is probably the next beat in that story. But we move on to this Lyra vignette, a lot of vignettes tonight and a lot of pre-taped ones. I think people are, saving them themselves uh, physically for the pay-per-views and, and probably for the go home next week. But 
We got Lyra saying uh, there's a force in you when you win the title. And it's the same force that uh, she has now inside of her that's going to help her keep this title, essentially. And that when Roxanne had the title, she couldn't climb the ladder and it broke her. Uh, and that she understands Roxanne's emotions, but that the title deserves better than this version of Roxanne. And no way in hell she's losing it, stand to deliver. I kind of dig the baby face being like, you were broken by the title because the whole thing was Roxanne had that weird, like anxiety thing. Right. I hated everything to do with that. And I hated her booking over the past year, but I like Lyra being honest about like you had it and you lost it and it broke you as a person when you had the title, like, well, not even that you lost it. Right. You couldn't hold on to it because you couldn't stand the pressure is what we've been told. So how are you going to do it again? Is like a very fair question. Uh, this Lyra title reign has not been the best from these, these women's title reigns. I always applaud NXT for how much time women's wrestling gets. The creative is not always great. And the title reigns really suffer because Roxanne's was weird. Andy Hartwell got injured and then called up. Tiffany had her feud with Becky and that was, or with she had it with Thea Hale, which had some kind of weird matches. Lost to Becky, who was great. And then the handoff to Lyra hasn't felt like it was so much about her as a champion. Has this weird Tatum Paxley thing. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't love the creative. I think Lyra is a great in-ring wrestler. And um, it, NXT is good for her right now because I think she has some time to develop how she is on the mic and stuff. Uh, I feel like Roxanne should go over. I think they need someone as strong as Roxanne to carry this and i think cora jade when she comes back would be a per good person to dethrone her and and send her up um any thoughts on this lyra promo i liked the truth to it but i'm still waiting for like that fire and intensity and naturalism to kick in for lyra on the mic i agree with you that the title reign itself has been kind of iffy i mean i feel like you get this big win over becky and it's this huge deal and like you're not really doing anything with it and you're kind of like oh that this is what that huge win led to okay but i did like the whole like you weren't able to climb the ladder line i thought that was like that was good i really like that but the other thing you could do if you want to do like the whole Tatum thing is you could have like Tatum be the one to beat Roxanne and then Tatum be like, look, I got our title back. I got our title back. And then that initiates that match. So that's a that's way. A very good call. And I, I guess I just don't know, like, what are we doing with Tatum Maxley? <laughs> like she's a weird hanger on her. She's hiding under the table during contract signings. Uh, we don't know why she's so obsessed with Lyra. I mean, Lyra's lovely. I get wanting to be her friend. But this obsessive thing is kind of weird and doesn't seem to be playing into this story as much. So not quite sure what to do about Lyra and Tater Paxley, as we call her here. So, uh, But we move along to what I thought was a really great match. And I admit it, okay? I'm a Duke Hudson stan. I love this guy. He is ceiling is so much higher than he's been given. And we saw it in this match tonight. And we had Dijak on commentary, and he was like, if this was Twitter, I would ratio Josh Briggs right now. And I was like, you go, Dijak. I appreciate you so much. Uh, but I love Duke Hudson, and let me tell you all the reasons why, okay? He kicked so much ass in this match. I loved it. We saw um, a wonderful Uranagi from him. We saw a huge Huracan Rana in here. We got a massive slingshot German suplex in this. Uh, we had so much of Duke Hudson kiss kicking Josh Briggs's ass that I was like, I don't know if this is like a good thing for Josh Briggs. We had a front face lock from Duke Hudson, uh, which he got shoved into the steps by Briggs on. Um, we got a chase U jab and some dusty elbows and a senton in this. And we get Briggs off the ropes into a boss man slam. And I was like, how is Duke Hudson not winning this match? Because <laughs> you knew he wasn't going to. But this does end with uh, Briggs hitting a lariat and then another really big lariat for the win. But that's after Duke Hudson hits him with a razor's edge. Like, this was so much offense for Duke Hudson. And I don't know if the story 
going into a match with Dijak and Obafemi should be, I snuck a win over Duke Hudson, who we haven't built at all. I was so glad to see this from Duke Hudson because I can love Duke Hudson. I think he's so underrated. I loved him in the 2.0 era and his uh, feud with Cameron Grimes. He has this very natural way about delivering promos and talking when he's not doing cartoonishly stupid stuff. Um, and he's a monster in the ring. And we got to see so many special things out of Duke Hudson tonight. And I was like, this is everything I want from Duke Hudson coming to life. And it makes no sense that it happens here with Josh Briggs because Josh Briggs going into a triple threat with Dijak and over freaking Femi should probably look really damn strong. And you only have one more week to build this. So it's not like he's like, okay, I stuck a win there, but I'm going to beat three more guys and beat them all more convincingly on the road. We got one more episode left. <laughs> so I loved this match because I'm a Duke Hudson Stan account. I was a huge fan of his before I even knew he was in TMDK, which is like my favorite stable in the home wide world. But I was confused about the way this match was agenting because I felt like Duke looked so much better than Briggs in this. And Briggs should probably look pretty strong going into a triple threat for the North American title, Kimmy. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the only reason in wrestling, so I gave this whole spiel on a podcast when, uh, for Revolution Predictions. I was like, why do we have triple threat matches in wrestling? It's because they're trying to protect somebody. So they're going to protect Dijak here. So Oba's probably going to pin Briggs for Dijak to be like, I didn't get pinned. It wasn't fair. Should have been a one-on-one -on -one match. Unbelievable. But I do agree that Duke ratio, was really ratio, ratio, ratio. <laughs> <laughs> literally and then people were still trying to tell me that hangman adam page or swerve was gonna win and i was like do, do you watch wrestling like triple threat matches again to protect do you, people do you even wrestling bro <laughs> exactly that, that's what yeah. i'm saying but this is why duke hudson is the mvp you know it it just fits that's why you know you like him so much because he's an mvp of chasey <laughs> And to be fair, you would think that everyone on JCU would want to win tonight, right? Kimmy. <laughs> I'm he so carries around this trophy like Linus and his security blanket. Put the trophy down! Put it in a trophy case! It's called a trophy case! You can put the trophy behind the trophy case. You don't need to carry it everywhere. He's proud of it. He lost it for a while. Get you a t-shirt! Get an MVP t-shirt! Would you My buy an MVP t-shirt if they like put that on like NXT shop? Would you buy one? Um, for Duke Hudson, maybe I would. For Duke <laughs> Hudson, by the way, Duke Hudson. So you know a little sour graps lore for you. Uh, Duke Hudson unintentionally gave birth to our pun gimmick because Alex accidentally called him Duck Hudson, and we just did duck puns the entire time. Complete accident, but um, so he's he's forever in our hearts for making our pun gimmick <laughs> work, but. I really do like the physicality of Duke Hudson combined with um, his ring IQ. And he's, he's very, very natural when he's given good stuff to say. I would like to see him pushed in accordance with what his potential is. I, I really want that. Um, and I would like him to just put keep the trophy at home. You know what I mean? Me, leave the memories alone a little bit. Let's. You know what it is? It's like if you're an MVP... You got to walk the walk of an MVP and talk the talk of an MVP. You don't see Aaron Judge walking around with his MVP award at every Yankee game and bringing it on the road. Come on now. Well, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story. So my senior year of high school, I actually won like the most athletic superlative in my high school. And my friend was making custom senior hoodies. And I was like, you know, you should put on the back that I won the most athletic superlative so I could brag about it to the entire school. And sure enough, she made me one. And on the back, it says most athletic. I still have it. And I wore it around school all day. And everyone was like, you have to be that cocky, don't you? And I go, yeah, because I won and I want you to know about it hell yeah and if i had known that in advance of this podcast i would have asked you to sport such a thing and i would have brought it up for this Duke I, hudson segment i will tweet but. it after this is done i will tweet please a do and i'll be like look guys we made it go go follow kimmy so that you can see she can back it up for you guys but uh, i will also give a, a quick plug to pixel duke hudson because uh, he's very fun to play in the 2K game. We found out his pendulum neck, uh, backbreaker in WWE 2K is very, very fun. His gameplay is really fun. Uh, it's not all just custom Zack Sabre Jr. matches that I make Alex play. We did play with Duke Hudson, and he was great. So 
Uh, I would recommend it if you have the video game play as Duke. It's a it's a fun way to go. So good stuff there. Uh, and then we get this match making the triple threat official, which I'm very excited about because I think, to your point, it's going to be a great match that Obafemi is very protected in. But you have Dijak and Briggs kind of staring each other down. I like that Dijak was on commentary. They don't do that a lot in NXT. And I think it's probably because it's a developmental brand. Maybe people aren't ready to be on commentary. But Dijak sure as hell is. It's not the ratio people from the commentary desk. But Obafemi is on the raised stage because, of course, he is because he's the greatest champion of the whole wide world. I love Obafemi so much. Uh, he congratulates them on their win and says that he has two worthy opponents trying to climb the mountain. And then he says he is the mountain because he has the coldest lines ever and that no one else can reach the summit. We got a triple threat match. We got Obafemi as your North American champion. I'm so impressed by what this guy does um, so early in his career. His selling, his emotion, him getting the story aspect of this so soon, him being able to work with someone um, like Dragon Lee and know how to sell for someone with that big of a size differential so early in his career. Like, I'm I'm an Oba feminist. I'm here for it. Uh, I know if Alex were here, he'd be gushing. I'm sure he'll um, be excited that we are getting to see him in a big spot. I hope he's excited about the triple threat. He'll probably have preferred a one-on-one -on -one match, but I think this is good, and I think you're right. I think Briggs is in there to take the pinfall so that we can set up Dijak and Ova Femi down the line at uh, Heat Wave or something, whatever their SummerSlam one probably is. But Yeah, that um, sounds right. Yeah, and I, I think probably a stipulation match we'll get to with, with Dijak and Ova Femi. I, I feel like that should be a multi-match feud because I feel like being as new as Ova Femi is and working with someone as experienced and versatile as Dijak is probably – Something you want to run back a couple of times. But uh, are you excited for this triple threat or would you have preferred a one-on-one? -on -one? I, I feel like because Dijak is finally kind of getting out of the Joe Gacy feud, I feel like he needs to look strong now, especially if there's no like plans as of right now to bring him up to the main roster. So I like that they are trying to protect him. I think Josh can take the loss without like the whole world shattering because I know a lot of times where they plan triple their matches and they're like, why did this person take the pin? And I'm like, well, there's a reason for it because they could take the loss and it won't affect them. So yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes total sense booking-wise. I love Obafemi. I was really concerned when he first won the title. I was like, is he ready? I don't know if he's ready. And I was like, oh, wait, no, they proved me wrong. He was ready. Thank God. But yeah, amazing title run so far. I think this is going to be a really good match. I'm excited to see how it all turns out. Next Saturday at noon, your WrestleMania pregame. That's right. That's right. I feel so bad for the talent that has to go into hair and makeup because you know they're getting there at like 5 in the morning. Oh, what a long year, day! Yeah, for last them. year it was like <laughs> last year it was like five or six the like call time because we were talking about it at WrestleCon like Sunday, and I was like, oh, I can't even imagine. And Ooh. we're on the West Coast. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And on the West Coast, that's right, man. And then they probably stay for all of WrestleMania too. So that is a long day for your NXT superstars, but a fun one because it's the biggest weekend of the year. Guys, get in your super chats and your humper chats. We've got our main event to talk about. But before we do, we'll get into this Ariana Grace thing. She's looking to give Gigi Dolan a makeover. We mostly just see her going through outfits. I feel like the elementary storytelling of the women's division is not for me. I think Ariana Grace is great at what she's been given. Her timing is excellent. She's been good in the ring from what we've seen so far. Uh the low blow to the lady parts was a weird thing to have happen. It feels like it would hurt even as a gal, but a very, uh, it was a choice that got a lot of attention. I'll let everybody make their own judgment calls on that, especially fellow gals. Uh, but we do have this Gigi Dolan makeover thing, which I get it. The alternative kid having to get a makeover from Miss NXT about this, uh, just feels more like we have a lot of people in high school or we have surfers and not a lot in between, <laughs> but, uh, but Ariana Grace showing a ton of potential as a, a very strong character wrestler very early on. Um, gimmicky isn't always for me, but when people are doing it extremely well, it makes me happy because it's for a lot of people and they want to see it. So um, 
very glad that she seems to be settling into this very nice, even though it's not my favorite thing in the world. Uh, any thoughts on our, our makeover of Gigi Dolan thing happening here? I, it's not my favorite use of Gigi Dolan either. I, I feel so bad because I feel like when Toxic Attraction broke up, Gigi got the worst of everything because they really just don't know what to do with her. And she's an amazing talent. She's shown that for years. You can time definitely time put again. her... Yeah, you could definitely put her somewhere, but I just, I don't know if this is the right place to put her. I'm intrigued to see what happens, but I mean, on the NXT program itself, you had the Metaphor promo, and then this, and then the Dragonoff promo. Did we really need these back-to-back-to-back? Especially if the yeah. Grace thing was 90 seconds? No. Yeah, that's a, a good point. There, It was a very, a very not just promo heavy, but produced promo heavy episode tonight. I'm sure they're just trying to keep people fresh for, for the pay-per-view, but it did make this arduous at points in the show like this. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. We move along to our main event, which was very, very good. Very, very good stuff from Braun Breaker. Um, and from Alpha Academy, who we knew, and I think we all assumed that the out, come of this match was going to be what it was but earlier we have Maxine Dupree telling Otis and uh, Tozawa to keep their eyes on the prize and Otis getting thirsty over Lash Legend which just I find a baby face being creepy horny over a woman who doesn't want it not great Kimmy like I don't feel like baby faces should be like my gimmick is creeping out women no thanks Hard pass to that. And he's done it multiple times and I'm over it. Um, we know that Lash Legend is very into trick. We found that out a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I don't like that. And I feel like Otis has gotten reduced to you're wrestling Chris Farley and you do the worm. And Otis has a lot more to offer than that. His comedic timing is great. He's very good at the funny stuff. It doesn't need to be one dimensional funny stuff. And uh, he has a lot more to offer than just that. So I would like to see that evolve. And I definitely want it to evolve past, hey, is, aren't I great as a baby face who sits around thirsting over women? It's fucking weird. I don't like it. And then we also get a promo where Braun is in the locker room with Corbin. Their little buddy-buddy relationship is very fun to me. I, it's a side that I didn't know Braun had. And I think Corbin has really brought out of him. But they're talking about how tan he looks. And Braun says, Corbin should try getting tan. Corbin says, tanning beds uh, aren't the actual sun. And <laughs> Braun gets Corbin some tanning spray that just says the sun. Which is one of the funnier things they've ever done in NXT for me. Uh, and the OC come in here and they say they want their match at Stand and Deliver to be a standard tag match. Uh, and they want to take the tiles from the wolf dogs. And what I like about that is that's what they should want. <laughs> that's what they earned. But Braun says they'll do their jobs tonight and the OC will do theirs next week. So I like this. I like that there was some logic to it. Braun Breaker is not known for lighting up the mic promo wise. It wasn't the best in his face run. I thought it was much better in his heel run because he had some teeth. And it kind of matched how explosive he is in the ring to just like take people out and be a little bit more stealthy. Uh, but this stuff with Corbin is some of my favorite stuff he's ever done. And uh, it makes me happy because I'm. it feels almost like he's as good as he's willing to be comfortable. And it feels like he's very comfortable with everything he's doing with Corbin. And I, I think that says a lot about Baron Corbin, honestly. So uh, the tanning spray being labeled the sun absolutely popped me. That is the most 4K shit in the world. Uh, very, very fun. Uh, what did you think of our promos before we get into this match? I like, so Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin confuse me just because Breaker's like on the main roster and he's still NXT Tag Team Champion. Like that's like such a big pet peeve for me. But I Thanks. love this. I love this duo. It is so well put together. I thought this was just going to be another one of those tag teams they put together for the Dusty Road Tag Team Classic and that they were going to split up and it was going to be like stupid. But they get it. And I'm so happy for Corbin because he's been putting in the work, no matter what you have to say about him. Like he's been putting in the work since day one of him, like being in WWE. And he's killed it in NXT. He killed on the main roster. Now he's back here. And you can tell he's having a great time. And I also did pop with the sun. I thought that was great. 
<laughs> Good stuff and a great match, guys. This is our main event, so get in your super chats and your humper chats if there's anything you want to talk about. Our normal jukebox is obviously handicapped by the fact that Alex isn't here and he does 97% of the impressions and I do one. So we will have only <laughs> Tiffany Stratton impressions at the end of the show. Uh, but a heck of the main event to close us out. I'm totally with you in that I find it very frustrating that Braun alone is called up to the main roster, but he's a tag team champion in a different brand and defending it on their biggest pay-per-view kind of feels weird unless he's going to maybe answer a challenge like the day after mania or something like if just i don't think this is happening but just for argument's sake say kevin owens wins the u.s title and he holds an open challenge a la john cena did to him right braun breaker is the guy to answer is like a very fun thing to do very quickly uh but that's a huge pet peeve of mine too is the lack of synergy between nxt and the main roster with these call-ups um, cause even with Mello, it feels like he was working baby face on the main roster, but he's super heel at NXT. So, uh, that is, that is frustrating, but not frustrating is our main event. This was a heck of a match. Corey already mentioned the spot of the night, which was that doomsday device. I said it before. I'll say it again. I get wanting to keep Braun Breaker a single star. It makes so much sense. Uh, cause he's great on his own, but when he's in these multi band matches, he was super fun with the Creed's and Trio's matches. He's very fun with Corbin. There's something about Braun Breaker being a hot tag where he gets to come in, do a bunch of explosive shit. He can put all his energy into the same five minutes of the match or whatever uh, and take breaks where he needs to. And I feel like that lets him work on a different level than he does as a singles competitor. And I really, really, really like that. Um, Booker T on commentary is brutal and with the alpha Academy tonight, it just felt like he doesn't watch the product at all. Um, <laughs> but I gotta say like, this was fun. The right team won. I feel bad for the alpha Academy. They're not going to stand and deliver. I don't see them fitting in on the mania card. Cause Chad Gable feels so separate from what's going on. Um, but this match was a hell of a lot of fun. I really like the wolf dogs working together. I'm very intrigued to see if they just call Baron Corbin up with Braun. Like if they run an angle where, Braun is like, man, I know I signed this SmackDown, but I, I don't, I don't want to do this without my, 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 the sun tanning guy, like Barry Corbin could just as easily go back up. Right. So I don't know. It depends where they want to put him, Kimmy, but I thought this main event was a blast. Find something bigger for Otis to do. Tozawa, they can't decide if he's a joke or a serious wrestler. Like they, they, they just won't make the distinction one week. He's fighting for the heritage cup. The next week he's taking a job spot to main roster in two minutes. Like, uh, so I would like some consistency, but, uh, a fun match tonight, a really fun match tonight. That doomsday spot had me nervous for Braun breaker, but he definitely pulled it off. What did you think of our, our main event tonight? So, like I said earlier, I thought it was a little rushed, and I think that's the problem with NXT every week, is, like, you can kind of tell when main events are oh, rushed right. or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have Tony Khan tweeting every other week, like, we're in a five-minute overrun, guys. Like, just do what NXT does. NXT buys a seven-minute, like, overrun every single week. <laughs> just buy the five-minute overrun, Tony. We, You have the money to back it up. I promise. You have the money. But we're not talking about AEW. Oh, by the way, um, I did see, I found our Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. Oh, you did? Yeah, they're on Dynamite tomorrow. Of course! In that tournament, right? Yeah. <sighs> My favorite brand, Kimmy. My favorite brand. Oh, I agree with you. I, I felt like I just really needed to let you know that I found them, they're alive, and they're okay. Oh, great. I thought they might have been on the posters in back of you, not like a match poster, but like a missing persons poster instead. But Listen, yeah. last week when I was on... um a collins pod we had said that we need you to make a poster for yuda yeah where put them yeah. on a milk carton yeah it's getting yeah. ridiculous at this point so we wanted you to do that so i'm also informing you that if you would like you can make one for wheeler yuda as well there you go <laughs> <laughs> but nxt that's what we're focusing on because it's not thursday i don't need to cry <laughs> for an hour and a half about Listen, it they're both developmental brands they both break my heart in very different ways but <laughs> i mean i get it i understand so the other thing i didn't get was like so they had this match and then next week is the number one contenders match for the tag titles 
why, couldn't they all just go do like a fatal four way to determine who they were wrestling? They sure could have. They sure could have, Kimmy. But I like that they they kind of sparsed it out. It is just weird that like the the champs were involved in one and not the other is like a very weird kind of like dynamic to to set up here. It's 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 a weird one. We get uh, the two other teams coming out here right at the end, but uh, it does definitely feel like it's the OC's time. To your point, Bron is called up to the main roster, so. I, I think that's a cool direction to head in. Are you excited for an OC NXT run? Our moderator is the biggest Machine Gun fan in the whole wide world. Uh, but I, I think this could be good for them, and I think they could do a lot of good work with some developing tag teams. I agree. I mean, they haven't really done anything since they've been back, since AJ Styles decides to just, you know, feud with LA Knight, and then LA Knight breaks into his house, and he gets all upset about it. <laughs> but I hope, so if they're going to stay in NXT, since Mia Yim isn't really doing anything on the SmackDown roster, I want Mia Yim to go with them. That would actually be very cool. I love Mia Yim. She's wildly underrated, in my opinion. She's been doing some really cool stuff on the main roster when she does have a shot, especially in counter wrestling she comes up with some really really creative counters to things would be very valuable mine to have an nxt i think that could be a lot of fun so don't hate that idea at all but that is our main event and we do have a couple more puns to round us out in rick bonnie saying it's dangy which i love very well done titan nick nemeth very nicely done <laughs> the hunk uh, just a nice quack chat, I think, for Duck Hudson over there from before. <laughs> Appreciate that always. Uh, and Ordlo, a very good boat pun. A very good boat pun. But we've got a couple of requests for me to sing in the stylings of Tiffany Stratton, which is good because if we had none, I feel like Kimmy wouldn't have gotten the full weirdo experience that is Sour Graps. It's definitely compromised when Alex isn't here because he is the purveyor of both Sour and an incredible array of voices. So let's get these going. Uh, we have Come Sail Away by Styx, which we will do first, and then we will close with the Death Clock birthday. Um, in my best Tiffany Stratton, which was the one impression I had on the show. I'm sailing away. Set an open course for the Virgin Sea, because I've got to be free. Free to face the life that's ahead of me. On board, I'm the captain, so climb aboard. We'll search tomorrow on every shore, and I'll try, oh Lord, I'll try, to carry on. I look to the sea, reflections in the waves spark my memory. Some happy, some sad. I think of childhood friends and the dreams we had. We lived happily forever, so the story goes, but somehow we missed out on the pot of gold. But we'll keep trying the best we can to carry on. Toodles! Not the toodles. <sighs> Not the toodles. Oh, only the toodles. That's all I got in this world, Kimmy, is my Tiffany toodles. <laughs> and we'll do a birthday song for the birthday boy, but not the birthday song. The death clock, birthday, death day. Uh, as we load, because there's a million ads on this page. Thank you to Louise, as always, for aggregating everything and making my job easy as host tonight. Okay. <clears throat> Many years ago, today, something grew inside your mother. That thing was you. You. You, you, you. Did she scream? Did she cry? Only one of those that are, only those that are born are the ones that get to die. This is so depressing for, a, for someone who requested it for their own birthday. This is very depressing, but one more year closer to dying, rotting organs, ripping, grinding, biological discordance, birthday equals self-abhorrence. Guitar solo. <laughs> Years keep passing, aging always, mutate into vapid slugs. Doctor gives a new prescription, bullet, not going to say the next thing, but one more thing closer to dying. Plastic surgeons fuel the lying. You forget why you came here. Your mind rots with every new year. Most depressing toodles ever, but happy birthday. What a song to send in for yourself. My God, I love you guys so much. The show is the funniest, weirdest little thing that we get to do. And it's always a special day 
when we get to introduce a stranger to our weird, wacky little community. It only happens like twice a year. The only time that we had a sub, I think, was with Joel when I hosted. And we decided he can't come back. He's way, way too, like, normal energy. I don't know. I don't know. But, Kimmy, thank you so much for filling in tonight. We really appreciate you joining us. I was like, we won't go two hours tonight. There's no way. We normally go two hours, but without Alex here, impossible. We're at an hour and 55. So thank you for being so generous with your time. Before we get out of here, I know we talked about it at the beginning of the show a little bit. Just wanted to give you a moment to plug everything and to also talk about the wonderful work you're doing with WrestleCon. I'll be there this year. Sean will be there this year. Take it away for us. Yes. Hi again. Thank you so much for having me. If you saw my tweet earlier, I had also said that being on Fightful was the one goal I had for this year, and I was able to do it. I'm very, very happy I was able to do it within three and a half months of the new year. So I got to set some new goals for myself, it seems. But yeah, WrestleCon is probably the biggest convention that you're going to go to during WrestleMania week. And there is so much to do there. There's a record number of talent there. There's a number record of people that bought tickets to WrestleCon, which is also really exciting. So if you're looking to do anything, please, please, please go to WrestleCon. You can go to the website. They have super fan tickets still up. That includes all three days of WrestleCon plus exclusive stuff just for you there's a sting q a thursday night there's also a breakfast a lunch and both wrestlemania nights there will be a watch party if you don't decide to go to lincoln financial field because you know the philadelphia bipolar weather might not be on your side i'm scared it's going to be like 30 degrees and i'm going to be sitting there like freezing my ass off and i really don't want to do that yeah. but yes my friends and I have worked very hard on this event. High Spots is an amazing team. They've been planning this for over a year, and I'm very excited that we're only like a week away. So like I said, um, if you're in the Philadelphia area next week and you're looking for something to do, just go to WrestleCon.com, and all the information is there for you. I'm so excited that all my media friends got in. It was <laughs> it was a nice little thing I tried to push for us to do. It's the first time we're ever doing it, so I really hope it works out. Hope and prayers, because I know I'm going to get the blame if it doesn't work out. <laughs> but, but other than that, yeah, you can head to the pop break to see a bunch of stuff that I write. I do Dark Side of the Ring reviews, which I'm going to watch right after this. So I get to learn all about Brutus the Barber Beefcake and all of his Dark Side of the Ring stuff. But there's an NXT review going to come up and there's a bunch of stuff next week as well. And when I feel in the mood, I tend to host a you know, Ring of Honor podcast when I get really upset that our champions don't appear on our show. <laughs> but you can also follow me on Twitter at Kimmy underscore Sokol. Today, I got a lot of follows from you guys, and I'm really thankful for that because I'm actually close to 1.3K. So if I could hit that by next week, that'd be really, really cool. And also, you can follow me on Instagram at Kimmy.Sokol. I don't know why I did the usernames two different ways. Like, it's the same name, but one has an underscore and one has a dot but yeah thank you again for having me on fightful and happy almost wrestlemania week guys happy almost wrestlemania week to you i put her on a ticker there at the bottom if you can go ahead and give her a follow we would so very much appreciate it everybody was so glad that you were here they want you to replace joel on in the weeds that's how much they liked you better than joel my god but kimmy did great Thank you, Kimmy. Nice to see you. Hope to see you again. Guys, give Kimmy all the love and support. She's a wonderful force, and she's also a woman in wrestling media, so you know how annoying her life is on some level. At least I do. Uh, we appreciate you filling in for us today. Please follow Kimmy on social media and support all the great work that she and WrestleCon are doing. As I mentioned, me and Sean will be there. Uh, Sean will be interviewing talent. I'll probably be camera wench, but come over and say hi, would you? We'll also be in town. Stay posted to Fightful Social Media and to mine and Sean's Twitter for uh, where we're going to be. I know Reg is also going to be in town for Supercard of Honor. We'll let you know what our ROH programming is going to be as well. You are going to have Alex Pulowski and Joel next week for AEW. Stay tuned for ROH, but you'll have Joel and Cardoza as well for SmackDown. So lots of substitutions going on for the biggest week of the year. Looking forward to seeing so many of you in Philly and so many of my other friends, including the beautiful Kimmy who joined us tonight. So uh, as we always say at the end of the show, because it's extremely normal, keep cool, Gabagools. Have a wonderful, safe week. <laughs>